have you ever been on a dating app? Okay. We were just like, okay, I'm help. I'm happily married, but I got to look at what's going on when people are talking about it. So I go on a dating, right? Dating app. I'm pretty sure I could read the entire, you know, it's fast. Don't give me yeah. this while it takes time for the juror to review everything. Come on. Yeah. If you, if yeah. we're paying for your ineptitude because you can't, you know, give the technology quickly to the juror or, or you waste time doing that, then shame on you. We need to do better. Hey guys, welcome back. Another episode of not as interesting as we think. I'm Dave. That's Julie. And we're here to talk about, you know, creative stuff and things. Right. (laughs) We got a, we got a full agenda. We have segments. We are turning, we are blossoming. For sure. Absolutely. Into a real life podcast. Yeah. We're getting there. We're almost right. a, we're almost a real boy, right? Uh, <laughs> Julia, you know, we've been we have these little notes that we keep for every episode of what we're going to go into, and they've been kind of like you know, you know, mishmash, right? You know, like pat, patched work together because like she's she's adding stuff and I'm adding stuff, and we're both using different size typefaces inside Apple Pages, and then Julie Colors. comes in this morning or like or <laughs> yesterday at some point. At some point she went in and edited it, and it was just like put like a full blown perfect outline i'm like okay well i guess i'm not touching this <laughs> she's this is just... fancy <laughs> it's like perfectly yeah so if you see me looking over this way that's what i'm looking at i'm looking at, i'm in awe of the organization that julie has put forth into this uh into this podcast so thanks for that julie oh you're welcome yeah <laughs> so we're going to do segments now we've got segments lined out we've got an outline folks and so uh, just I'm going to run it down for you a little bit, just so you understand exactly, you know, how we're trying to make this work. Now, of course, this is subject to change, but this is how we're running <laughs> it right now, right? I mean, we, we're we subject to change pretty much every time we get up here on the microphone. But we're starting it off with what we're calling lifestyle basics. And this is a short segment, but, we're, you know, like we feel like it's important for us to share a little bit of our own life, right? Our own experiences, our own little things that kind of give us some nuance as opposed to just being two, you know, talking heads talking about creative business stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, then we're going to talk about our different topics, and we have a couple of different topics we want to share. Then there's some yeah. other little tidbits that we've got coming, little surprises that I'm gonna that we're gonna drop on you at the end, and uh, you know, you can let us know what you guys think. Yeah. So, yeah. Basically. So it, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Basically, what's happening with your lifestyle, Dave? This week. Oh. This week on, we're not as interesting as you think. <laughs> so you know um i posted up yesterday about like i finished the second day of my training for my course called choose your words and this one has been a live event and it's been an interesting experience for me to do a, a live event because it, it's off camera right here but i have a, a you know whiteboard a standing whiteboard and i had a flipboard and it was doing like very analog strategy and it worked for the most part but there were like bumps in the road because it was my first time and doing it live in front of other people. You know, you're, you're bound to make mistakes. So I learned some things about that. And it really made me think like, okay, this was fun. It was fun to have the live interaction with people. But it was also uh, very stressful and it made me very anxious. Like I, I finished that and I, re- I recognized that I was just like sweating profusely underneath my <laughs> arms. And I was just like, oh my God. We finished that. It was just like, oh God. It was like my, you know. My, I could feel almost like my heart rate going a little bit. And it's not like it's, I don't do well on camera because I, you know, obviously we're here, we're doing it here and I've done it many times in YouTube videos or whatever, but yeah, it was just, it was a little bit like it gave me an anxiety and I don't think it was just because I was recording live, but it was like, I have, you know, like having to dance, right. Dance, dance monkey, right. <laughs> Perform for the camera in it for a live studio audience and it, it just gave, i don't know i guess it gave me appreciation for anybody that gets up on stage like when you go to plays or whatever and do things and and hopefully not screw up too much you know so that was my life and uh it's been interesting and i probably i don't know i may not ever do it again I, hilarious <laughs> I may, to one I and may, done right, that's your yeah. swan song <laughs> that's yeah. a swan everything song. else will be pre-recorded from now going forward i don't know we'll see but, you know. did you did you hear the timer go off on you Mm-mm. Oh, was there a timer? Oh, 
Yeah, that's right. We're, we're this, is to something, <laughs> this is something I'm going to hear in the headphones. Like in the last episode, I heard I, it was raining and the dog w- came in soaking wet and was just like on the hardwood floor all over the place. And I was like, oh, no, I can't edit that out. <laughs> and now Dave's, Dave's talking on his acceptance speech and the curtain's coming down. <laughs> Yeah, the curtains come down. Yeah, like I'm out there, like I don't care if the bands. You can't talk. I'm talking over. I'm the band. playing you off. I'm playing you off. <laughs> right. uh, lifestyle basics for me. I don't. Um, you know, I am. It's, it's, it's a completely different. For well, for once since the lapis, last episode, there's no more COVID in the household. We've passed our um, t- time period where uh, my um, extreme diligent in germ control. I was able to contain that to one member of the household. And, um, the sun is out. It's not raining. It's a completely different set of circumstances here. The creativity comes a lot easier. I'm happier just to be able to stand outside and not be wet. Mm. It's it's so I'm really enjoying that. They say that we're going to have a lot more rain potentially this weekend or whatever. I don't know if that panned out all the way. I haven't um, looked, uh, for the updated forecast, but, um, much appreciation for the sunshine right now. Totally. Yeah. I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the forecast here at Long Beach. We are pushing to Monday uh, afternoon. So okay. we've got a few more days of sunshine, which is good because my boy. Thank has God. A, uh, because I feel like a total swimmy. I feel like a totally different person. I mean, that was a lot of rain. I had it, I had it in my, um, my, um, intensive like NASA, um, supplied weather station that I have bolted to my roof. There was something like 1,900 minutes of rain so far this year. Month wow. today in February alone in San Diego, specifically at my house. Because you know how when you look at the weather forecast and it's like, well, you're like, well, where is this? That's not what it is here. That's why I put it up there. Five inches of rain here. Wow. That's a lot. And it's and it was that was like the first eight days of the month. So yeah. we're drying out. Yeah, that's good. You're drying out. Everybody's yeah. drying out. We're trying out, yeah, yeah. Get a little bit of that vitamin D, and it, you know, like uh, I, I recognize now that that seasonal depression is definitely so a thing, real, right? Yeah. So real, right? Because yeah. I mean, obviously, we are totally yeah. acclimated here to you know, warmish days and bright sunshine, and to have that to go for that long period, even and most people, everybody else, and like anybody who lives in the northern northwest or whatever, is like laughing at us. But like, we went a week with gray skies, and we were like. This is the worst thing ever. Just want to yeah. jump off a bridge or something. Yeah. Um, Those know, people so. don't understand what five inches of water does to the Southern California landscape. It's <laughs> not built for that. There's flooding. It's not, the infrastructure is not here to, to that's the whole thing. I'll, I'll, I'll die on that hill with that battle, honestly. Yeah. 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 Sure. yeah. yeah. Anyway, so let's yeah. get into it today. Um, okay. So our first topic today is pay for play schemes. Um, and you know, we both have our experiences on this, but this is pay for play schemes within the cons, you know, and it's probably not just art, like visual art, but like it probably happens in other places too, but these are the experiences that we've had. And what we're referring to is like, like you have these entities, whether it's galleries, dealers, publishers, uh, anybody that wants to showcase art but they do so by making you pay for the opportunity first. And so you told me a little story about something and we're not going to name names. We're not going to point to specific fingers, but you had a personal experience about this, Julie, and I wanted you to share that. Um, you know, well, recently I applied for a magazine. I paid the submission fee and what wasn't, I don't made clear at the time was what kind of art the juror was looking for. And when the rejection letter arrived, I was like, wait, what? That's like my best work ever. Um, I looked at the artists that were accepted and I was like, holy hell, Salvador Dali. This is not the way I paint. Like not even remote. I had no business even applying so I feel that perhaps, you know, and a lot of times when you submit, you don't know who the juror is. So mm-hmm. it's also subjective. It makes me wonder, you know, I, 
it's putting a bad taste in my mouth. I don't do it very often. I only applied for that one publication because it was at the end of the year and I, you know, I need it. I'm like, okay, well, I have a little bit of money to spend for that. Um, I don't know, but it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. It, it really does. But so just to clarify, you said you paid for the magazine itself, right? You, you, you paid for an annual subscription or something like that. I did subscribe. And then okay. I, um, I subscribe, I liked the issue that I saw. I subscribed and then I saw the call and then I submitted also for the call. So we're talking, okay, out of everything, I'm like upwards of $170. You know, this is a sheet. This is a fancy magazine, four or five issues a year. I think it's probably quarterly, very expensive. Um, I've never, I had never seen it in print locally. So I'm like, okay, you know, that's, a lot of magazines cost that price. It's not, it, that wasn't a shock, but I was, I'm very, have, you know, almost a little under $200 for both experiences. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to just like to get a rejection and then just keep the money. Right. Like oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's where so it gets then, a little weird you know, because how many people are, how, cause there's only so many pages, right. And mm -hmm. how many people actually submit every single time they put out a call to a call to a you know call to order whatever so here's the here's the situation and this is what happens in my head dave and tell me if you would go along the same thing so i'm thinking okay well the your the rejection letter is going to tell you well you know we're very sorry but we received xyz amount of applicants for this edition and the and the judging was very difficult and whatever whatever i immediately take that number and multiply it times the acceptance fee then i start to look through the magazine and i'm wondering okay where's the where's the money going here um, there's a large staff on this magazine and surprisingly the interviews that they're doing with the artists are not, um, unique to each specific artist. Every single interview is the same. So yeah, same who's five, doing six questions, right? Right. And that's, you know, honestly, between you and I and uh, uh, you, Dave and I and not, and we, we actually, that's the reason why we're not doing an artist specific podcast is because they just, over time, it's the same, the same thing over and over. And, you know, I don't know that that's probably a whole nother topic, but there's no journalism in sending somebody 10 questions and then that eat the artist writing a paragraph and then just copying and pasting, making an app, a magazine. And then furthermore, the fact that we're going to pawn that off on our readership, that's paying, you know, $25 with shipping per episode, per, uh, copy. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. we could, I think, honestly, I think we can do better. I think people yeah. should do better. Yeah. And I, I was, uh, you know, Offline on a different conversation, you and I were talking about this where like back in the day, I had a, an experience with a book situation like that. This was years ago. I was a kid. I was in my early 20s. And um, I don't remember how I got introduced. It, it might have been my my buddy who was a writer introduced me to it. But it's basically like it was a thing you got in the back of a magazine where you submit your poem to the uh, National Poetry Association or something like that. And, you know, I'm sure if anybody's, you know, in our age group, they've probably have seen something like this, but they, you, you submit your poem for a fee and it's not even that much at, at the time. It was like maybe $20 or something like that. And then, you know, you get in, uh, you know, get chosen. Right. But the book is this thick. Right. And it's just pages after pages of like, let's be honest, crap poetry. You know, I was right. 20. I, I couldn't write <laughs> crap. I couldn't write good poetry at 20 years. I can't write good poetry, period. <laughs> let alone when I was in my 20s. But it's all poetry because they, they just accept everybody, right? And then they get you on the, you know, like, hey, if you want copies of the book, they're $75 a piece, you know, which I could understand why it would be so expensive because it was a big book. It was like hardcover, you know, and like, and- Yeah, you know, well, that, I mean, that sounds nice. Sounds nice yeah. to have, right? Yeah. Except ours had like a weird kind of unicorn- you know, like thing on the front picture of like, like that was, the, it was like, it wasn't like a full cover. It was like the, you know, just like the, the page plate or whatever, but it was like a unicorn in a fantasy field. And I'm like, what is this? Right. It's like, it's not even really a good, like, you know, but you know, so yeah. So I had some experience with that in the publish publishing side and, you know, um, where I've seen it is in real life situations with galleries and, and, um, you know, and dealers and whatnot, where they put up a, you know, an open call, for people's art and you'll you'll sometimes you'll see these in the back of like magazines or whatever of art magazines open call to all artists of this type or whatever and that goes wide to their entire readership 
and of course that you know a certain only a certain percentage are going to join it but even if they're that's like thousands of people to be as part of this open call for this juried event you pay for that to get in and your things are not refundable and then they have a show and only 50 out of the hundreds get you know get put put up on the walls right they don't have space to hang they you're right. that's exactly right right so but everybody gets their every, your your entry fee gets kept because it's like an application fee because we want to, we need to you know use it to for the jurors time to review right because it takes you know however long to review one person's art but i'm sure like i've done with friends of mine here locally we've done our own open call and we, we didn't charge anybody until they were accepted right but mm -hmm. the, what what these like i'm sure like going through that is pretty quick like nope nope yes no yes well, possibly no you know like go through it pretty quickly like ha have you ever been on a dating app okay we was just like yeah. okay i'm help i'm happily married but i got to look at what's going on when people are talking about it so i go on a dating right dating app i'm pretty sure i could read the entire you know it's fast don't give me yeah. this while well, it takes time for the juror to review everything Get, come on yeah if you if yeah. we're paying for your ineptitude because you can't you know give the technology quickly to the juror or or you waste time doing that then shame on you we need to do better yeah well and i think that what it really comes down to is that they're not they may be interested in sharing good work within their gallery but it's entirely possible that they make a, more of their money on the application fees than they do selling the art in the show. 100%. Yeah. So 100%. there's a couple of galleries here locally that do something like this. And they're small galleries and, so, and they're local. So they're not going to get a ton of applications, but they do like monthly or, or you know, every six week shows. And so they're constantly doing a new, hey, you know, you know, be part of this next show, be part of that next show. And every time, every single time it's another entry fee and it's, it's nominal, right? It's only like, I don't know, maybe 25 bucks, but e if you get rejected and they have 10 to 12 shows a year and you get rejected six of those 10, I mean, that's $150 out of your pocket that you don't get to capitalize on. And you have to take all the work and go to the gallery, you know, like get it all to them and then go back and pick yeah. it up if it doesn't sell and all that, you know, and then wait for them to send you money if they do sell or whatever. So you know, you're out all this money. Did you make enough to make it worthwhile? Because a lot of times these galleries that do these big open calls, they're not selling big work. They're selling these small pieces because that's, they have to maximize how much wall space each of these pieces have, right? So would you say, would you say perhaps they're selling primarily more of the socks and underwear than the Cadillacs? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's generally... I mean, we're not talking big LA galleries here. We're talking small, you know, secondary towns outside of LA. That, right. Uh, you know, the, like the, you know, the, the South Bay, which is along the beach side and all that. And all that, you know, it's not the same vibe as going to a, you know, a prominent LA gallery. It's not even the same vibe at all. It's not the same audience. And so the people that are going there are probably not going to drop thousands of dollars on a painting on a regular basis. Right. So I get it. I get that they're trying to they're trying to cater to they're getting some sales in and that's probably also why they have lots of different pieces because they want to see if they can sell a lot of little ones versus like a few big ones. Yeah. But it makes still, it more like, obtainable. Yeah, just the fact that they're trying to make money on the submission process both in these publications and books or these, you know, galleries like this. It's just one of these things like just I don't know. Maybe a lot of people have thought this, maybe they haven't even thought about it, but it's just one of these things that we've, we've come across and we wanted to share like, Hey, like, Hey, buyer beware. Right. Yeah. <laughs> just take it for what it is. You know, take it with no expe ex expectation. If you have 30 bucks to blow on the, in the, and that's what you want to do. If that makes you feel better, go ahead. Um, if you, if you keep rep getting you know, declined notices over and over, take that for what it's worth and maybe, you know, fine tune, readjust and, you know, see what you're doing. But uh, I, I think we're not the only two people that are talking about this. And I think that this is something that people should hear. If I'll, I'll close it out like with this, you do you, right? But um, if, you're, if you're trying to build up your CV, you know, you're trying to build up your, your resume of how many places you got into, then by all means, you know, do that. Because, you know, sometimes other bigger galleries will recognize, okay, 
you've been in a lot of places, maybe it's time for you to take it to the next level, right? Or right. if you put yourself in publications like that and you do get accepted, well, okay, you can add that to your resume and that looks good. Even though they yeah. also, these places, they recognize that this is like a kind of a pay-for-play game for a little bit. So right. you know, you've got to do your due diligence, but don't ever take these as like, they're going to be the thing that rockets you to the next level because that's not how exactly. it works. Exactly. Don't lose any sleep over it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about uh, something that you brought up for me. Um, and that's turning content into other things, free content, normally, stuff that we would normally share, like say, whether it's, you know, a, a, a video tutorial, um, a blog post or something like that, that we would normally share free, but perhaps it has much better value and can be taken to the next level. Like maybe it's taken to the level of um, a free download or uh, enter your e email address to get this free course or something like that. Or um, it, it's turned into uh, you know, like a way to, maybe it becomes a course in itself or it leads to, like if you, you watch this video and it leads to something bigger. But you mentioned it because I wrote a blog post that I hadn't, well, I published it for about 20 minutes. <laughs> And then you said, take it down, Tafe. Take it down. That's too good. You got to take it down. And I was like, why? Why should I take it down? At first, when you first said it, I was like, oh, what? Is it not good? Did I do something wrong? And you were like, no, that's too good. You have to, you should take that and bundle that into something free so that you can help get people into your newsletter. And I that was really, a... I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to no, say, no. it was really poignant for me because. I've been, I haven't been pulling as many new people in as I've wanted to lately. And I, you know, I'm not getting that. We're not getting the same reach on threads that we are. We're de I'm definitely not getting the same reach on Instagram. I'm not getting the same reach on social media. So I need to find ways to pull people in. And so it was very poignant conversation at that moment. So. Well, if there's something that I am, it's poignant. Here's what I think about this. <laughs> Dave wrote a really amazing article on a topic that a lot of people are asking about over and over. The article was totally complete. It was concise. It was excellent. So what I think people need to understand is if you're going to try to make money in the art business as a creative and whatever, I've already spoken about this in the last episode, you need to diversify your available your wares, right? So it's very important, I think, to have a free something that somebody that can sign up for on your website to understand who you are and what you can do. Dave might be an expert at uh, this topic in particular. He might be, but he could maybe you not be able to clearly explain it. That happens a lot with people. You know, just because you know something doesn't mean that you can teach it. Newsflash. So because you can, it, it, I think it's important that you put that information on your uh, website for people to take and see more about you. And then you're collecting their information, you're collecting their email address, their contact information, so that maybe potentially down the road, when you expand on that topic, you have a, you have a, a, a date, a group of individuals who you can market that content to. And I know a lot of people be like, Oh, marketing is too many emails and, and whatnot, whatever but you honestly, it's time to embrace this idea because this is what it's going to take for you to serve survive. If you think that you're only going to be able to sell paintings and maintain your income and whatever, it's not, you can't, you can't. I'm, I'm very few people can. So don't fall into that false sense of security. If that's what it's going to do. So if you, if you excel at a certain topic and you're able to explain it and you're well-spoken, well-written, you may want to produce a free video that you can email to people, or you may want to produce a, a, a sim, as simple as a, a quick PDF outlining a brief collection of points. And you know what, at the bottom of that PDF, you can tell people if you'd like to learn more, you can. 1995, mm. you join here, subscribe, whatever, whatever. I, I yeah. believe so strongly in this. Yeah. So I'm going to pull the curtain back a little bit on my own thing, just to kind of give a little bit more context about like, the things that I've been thinking about since that conversation. Okay. So I have another post that's out. And by the time this video goes live, I'm actually going to pull that one down as well. And that one is all about how to get started in newsletters right in 2024. So if you haven't read that article, 
well, I guess grab it now. See this, it'll be gone. <laughs> it will be a free download at some point. But right. what I'm going to do is, and be very clear about this is that, hey, if you want this information that I've given away for free, you know, just, you know, sign up, join my list and get in on that. But what I'm also going to do within that, right, and I'm going to make it like a like a simple document. But at the end of that, it's going to be, there's going to be a thing at the bottom that is like, hey, by the way, I have this other thing that I'm doing, and it's only $49, but it will provide you with tons of inspiration for content for an entire year. And that's all it is. You've already got, you're already interested in doing the newsletter thing. And some of you may be like, I don't even know what to write about all the time. Well, I've got you covered. And it's 50 yeah. bucks, right? There. You don't have to do it, but it's there for you if you want it. Right. This is so important, especially now with the um, ability to reach your audience is very challenging across all levels to have that set of contact, those contacts available to you. It's really, really important that and your website and your home base. And for people to be able to see who you are before they make the purchase is super important. Yeah. I think I said super important 17 times in this segment. <laughs> because it was super important. It is super important. I mean, honestly, it's super important. Real well, talk. I think, <laughs> I think it's something to be, you know, I, there are going to be people that will push back on this idea because they think like, especially we were saying like, you're not going to be able to make a living with the, not that you won't be able to make a living with your art, but you're not going to be able to, like the logistics of being able to sell enough art pieces in order to keep your life, you know, like fulfilled is it's if people really thought, you know, did the math on it about how much work would it, it would actually take to do that. It, it It's it's difficult. It's time consuming. It would it burns a lot of people out. But what if instead you were able to produce enough art that makes you happy? Right. And then you supplement with these other things that allow you an opportunity to just kind of like breathe a little. So you don't have to grind, 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 make new art, make, sell everything, you know, be on social media all the time. Um, you know, I shared an article this weekend, this past week in the, the, uh, from Vox media about everybody's a sellout now, right? Because we just, it's just the nature of the beast right now where we just feel like we have to, like, I have to dance for my supper on social media in order to get enough attention to sell a piece of art. And then once I've sold that piece of art, then I got to do it and grind again and go over it, you know, do all the the administrations of all this stuff um, just to get a little bit of money from the art that I'm making, as opposed to like having a little bit of that, but then also providing some value in different ways that also brings in something, even if it's just the attention of pulling people onto your email address so that you have a captive audience to send them notifications like, hey, I've got new prints available. Here's a brand new original piece. This is the new t-shirt and mug series that I've made or whatever, you know, like, and I'm just, you know, I'm rattling off ideas, but you know, it, it's not going to apply to every single person. It but does. It's a good option. <laughs> yeah. Well, it I does. mean, it, well, some people might not want to sell mugs and shirts. But some people yeah. oh, don't well, do original yeah. art, you know, stuff the like idea. that. The idea. The idea yeah. does. Dave, this is very important. <laughs> Super important. There's Super not important. enough. There's not enough people talking about this. And the reason I know this is because there was uh, just because of the nature of what it is, the, there's more, there are more people that are asking me about how to mix this color of pink than how to run an art business. And, and there's more people that are focusing on the production of the art and how come I can't, I'm not making enough money. I can't pay my bills. I can't do this because I can't sell this piece of art. You need to diversify. I'm going to totally disagree with the statement that they said on Vox about being a sellout, because let me tell you something. Does the tire store, are they a sellout because their sign outside says tires, but inside they also sell brakes and mufflers and freaking air fresheners? Are they <laughs> yeah. selling out? No, yeah. it's because that's the, that's what it takes to be successful in bitch in business. Yeah, it is. Well, and I think it sell out. Come on. Well, I think, okay, so to, to defend the article a little bit, what they were oh, implying boy. is that we, what we used to call, what used to be referred to as selling out has cut, like the, the definition has definitely had to change just because of the landscape, right? And it's not so much about like not selling, you know, like if you're only doing art, you don't sell mugs and, and t-shirts. It's not that. It's more like 
the, the don't say courses. Need... Okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's not about the products that get, or the, the things that get produced. It's about how we have to do the, these, these things that we never imagined we'd have to do in order to get the attention to the thing. So doing kind of goofy TikToks. Yeah. You know, okay. So you responded to this woman the other day on threads where she, you know, she talked about, I didn't know I was going to have to, you know, lay on the floor with, with, you know, a bunch of chiseled erasers or whatever. Um, and you, you I, don't I, don't yeah, I don't remember what I said, but you responded to her, but it made me think of like her, her initial post was just about this idea. Like I, this is not what I imagined my artistic life to be was that I, I make my art and I love the things that I do. And I think it's unique and it was unique, you know, but it was that she had to, she felt like she had to do a reel and do a TikTok and, and follow these trends and do all this stuff. I know Go what ahead. I said. I know you're like waving your hand. I know. I, it's like, it's like, it's coming back to me now. It takes a little time. Yeah. I yeah. said that you, you know what? There, uh, here it is. Here is the <laughs> truth. Everybody come to Jesus meeting. Okay. How are you to think that you produce content and automatically everybody's going to see it. You are competing with every single Tom, Dick and Harry in the universe to get views on your content. You need to make it special. That's what it, you know, she, this, this, uh, the user was commenting how everything had to look nice. She had to do this or whatever. This is the same thing that Martin Scorsese does when people go to watch a movie. We pay attention to the set design, the hair and makeup, the costume, all this stuff, the audio, whatever. You're in a, it, this is a competition. This is not your guaranteed right to post media on, uh, post anything on social media and boom, go viral. You need to work. This is work. If you want to post media to, to if you want to post content to social media for fun, don't complain that you can't sell any paintings. Yeah. You got to make well, the effort. Right. That, I get very that, upset that, that I, I, I'm very, <laughs> look at me. I'm stuttering. I get very upset when people, when people talk about that because it is work. There yeah. are ways to simplify. There are ways to do it better. There are ways that are, to make it easy. And that's why I hope people tune into a podcast like this, but that's the truth. Yeah. Don't and, expect it's not a given. Yeah. And I think that it, you know, playing a little devil's advocate here, I'm, you know, knowing oh, no. the voices of some of these people. No, it's not my view. It's, but it's oh. definitely, I know what some, um, it's that the, a lot of artists didn't become artists to do that. Right. That wasn't right. like on their playlist. Right. Okay. But, but you are correct. You are 100% correct. That if did you, perform did in, you, I, I'm very, Dave, I'm cutting you off. Did you become <laughs> an artist to sell your art? Are you or are you not trying to sell your art on a free freaking platform? Yeah. Yeah. Do the yeah. work. It, you know, <laughs> it, Sorry, it, fired uh, up. <laughs> no, no, no. I get it. I get it 100%. Um, I think that you, you're 100% correct that if we're going to show up on these places and the level of, of performance and production quality is is going up, which it's the exact same thing over on YouTube, right? Because back in the day, YouTube was like cat videos and a bunch of, you know, teenagers looking at their, you know, being in their cameras like this, talking to everybody, you know, saying, you know, like, <laughs> right. That, that's, that's exactly what it was, right. You know, back in the day, but now it's like, you go and it's like, there's, I mean, Mr. Beast puts a million dollars into every video that he makes or more sometimes, you know, because of like, that's what he feels is necessary. Should we all be Mr. Beast? No, but oh. there's a happy medium in there of yes. a level of performance that needs to be done yes. or at least performed so that we can garner the attention because the fact of the matter is you're right. Number one, it's free. Stop complaining about not getting views. Number two, because of the nature of the platform, we... The, the people who are on it have been programmed to perform in a certain way, meaning, the, you know, the scroll, the tap, tap, scroll, tap, tap, scroll. And if you can't, like, if you're not adjusting how you work towards the, that audience, then you're not going to find it. And I know a lot of purists are going to be like, well, I don't want to perform for the audience. I don't want to, you know, I, I want to just do my art. 
and I don't want to downplay that, but I want to just do my art and have people accept me for what it is I do. That's fine. But it's going to take you a ton longer to get there than if you were to, you know, maybe put a little bit of effort into your production, maybe put a little bit of effort into your themes, your content, whatever it is that you're planning to do. As a full, you know, being fully rec you know recognizing who i am as an individual i don't like that side of social media but i don't blame instagram for my lack of views i blame myself for not wanting to go through the motions of that because it doesn't feel it feels disingenuous to me a little bit i show up you're putting on blame you're, you're, that's super good you can't put yeah. the blame on something you put the blame on a, an app that nobody knows how it works yeah well, you know, and I just show up and I do my thing, but it also taught me like, that's why, that's why the hungry exists because I recognize that that's where I shine. Right. And I'm actually thinking about going back and doing a couple you know, more YouTube videos here in the near future, because I shine in that place and I shine in my own way, but, and it, which means I'm not going to go Mr. Beast level. You know, I don't have any intention of doing that, but I can do little things to make myself better in the environment. Like we've got, I built this studio space that's supposed to like the idea is that it looks kind of like a lived in studio as opposed to Julie's like, you know, perfectly organized and, you know, golden. This is a lived in <laughs> studio. <laughs> I know what I mean. I know you work in that, but I mean, like if you look at my, you know, the disarray going on back there with my books and my, my drop cloths and, and all this stuff here, like the paint. And then, you know, and then Julie is like, this is, a, this is a perfect example of the difference between Julie and I, Julie is very well, she keeps her stuff, you know, very organized and she does really, and me, I'm just throwing paint on the wall a lot. <laughs> yeah. But that's what the, but that's the environment that I want to create for in, in that, in that place. And I want that to feel that way. So I can increase, I can do things to kind of make that look better, make it feel better and cre increase my production value by adding new technology, like new equipment, better cameras and stuff like that. Just because, you know, it's like I want to level up without sacrificing who I am inside, right? I, I, I perform it, the way I want to perform. I'm very neat inside. So that's it. Listen, <laughs> what if nothing social media teaches you in, almost instantly people like certain stuff can you explain why people like some things and why they don't like other things no because then everybody would be you know like we'd be robots with all the same micro central processor or whatever people mm -hmm. like certain stuff this goes directly into the the last topic of the day because we went a little over on the other on this current topic people like certain things the most important thing you can do is learn from it and it's very easy. The topic is, have you ever mimicked your process against someone that's more experienced or more popular or more successful at selling art? And I'm going to ask, does this mean the process of social media and content creation? Or does this mean art process? Art process? No, my art process is all organic. But yes, 100% yes. If some social media mega creator, content creator has 3 million followers and continually has made successful posts after post. And I look in their, their, I look at their content and I, I don't copy it word for word, but I'll tell you one thing that I, something that I would look at. If this person posts for sake of talking every day at 5. AM I'm posting at 5. AM. Mm. If this person has two camera angles or whatever, or uses trending audio, I'm going to use trending audio and have two, um, camera angles. Hmm. that's it's, it's as simple as it's anything that I can do to help boost it. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Well, and I think that goes to, um, you've, you've seen the book steal like an artist or heard of no. it. No. Okay. I don't read so, <laughs> right there. Steal like an artist by Austin Cleon. It's a very popular book, um, amongst people who, you know, can't seem to find their way and it's really simple read, but, the thing about it is it's just exactly what you said. It's like, we're not, when we go to figure ourselves out to find who it is, like whether it is the actual creativity itself or the processes of how somebody else did something well, we can take little bits of that and make it our own, right? Yeah. We, 
you know, you took these processes of uh, filming video and sharing and Cues, when sharing all this right. stuff, right? And then turned it into your own thing. You didn't do their videos exactly. No. Which happens a lot, by the way. A lot yeah. of people do this, right? They do the exact same video, share the exact same audio, share the exact same script right. even, right? Those maybe are sellouts, right? Yeah, 100, 1,000%. Yeah. So there's that, but then there, or there's just the idea of like, Hey, I really like what they did there. I'm going to do my take on it or right. Um, maybe it is visually right. Like, I mean, Austin Cleon is the impetus for the hungry. His he's been doing this email list for a long time where he, every Friday he sends out an email that's like 10 things that were interesting to him that, that week. And it used to just be like a single line and a, and a link to something. <laughs> But uh -huh. now it's like they're getting a little bit more like they're two or three sentences long each one now and they're robust and it's it's good. And it was the it was that concept of sharing 10 things in an email that are be interesting to a particular audience that made me think like, oh, this is I'll do that first. And that's how the, the hungry got started. And then it grew, became something a little bit more like bigger than that over time. But that's where it came from, because I took. I stole his idea a little bit, right? And turned it into my own thing. That's fine. I think yeah. it, I mean, just be observant. Obser just be observant. And then do the work. <laughs> and do the work. And do you the have work. to yeah. do the work. I mean, honestly, there's not, you can't even like walk down the street and pass a shop owner and think, okay, they're not doing the work. You know, they're dusting the, they sweep the, the doorway every day. They dust in there. It's just, this mentality that everything is going to be given to you automatically because you make a, a video with trending audio or whatever is, um, I don't like to see that. I don't, I definitely don't like to read about it. And, and for those are, I, I, I delete a lot of my responses to people when I see that online, but, um, that doesn't have to be the, the way that it is. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, now that you've dialed it down a little bit, now that we burn, yeah. brought, the, brought the burner down a little bit. <laughs> Whew, the burner's yeah. sun low. Did you hear about so, this? What What do you think about this building? Oh, right, this, yeah. So Yeah, so you want, you want me, I'll tell you what I know. You're, you're yeah, closer to the epicenter. So uh, for those of you who don't know, there is a, what is a 30-story skyscraper in Los Angeles that yeah. is- I think uh, it's actually that, two, but yeah. Yeah, there's two. Okay, a pair, there's a pair, it's a very, very large, tall buildings in Los Angeles where the developer lost, uh, ran out of money. So the buildings are sitting there in a, uh, not, not completed, which has, um, made them targets for graffiti artists. And you, you've probably seen these, these pictures where every floor is tagged with a lot of, um, spray paint. Yeah. And they are saying that the developer is, um, not in the country and that, cars are smashing through the barricades. They're going in there to steal the, the copper, whatever's in there, whatever state of construction it is. And they are the, the street artists, vandals in this case, are, are breaking and entering and they are in there and they are tagging this. They are now paragliding off the, off the building. It's an unsafe situation. Um, mm -hmm. The police and the resources for the city of Los Angeles are there every day to try to maintain this. And apparently attempts to reach the developer are not um, being, they, they can't get any response from the developer and they're trying to say, well, they want the developer to secure the property and to clean it up or the taxpayers have to clean it up. Yeah. That wow. last one is, that last one is, yeah. And it's ultimately, that's probably what's going to happen. Um, it's probably going to be that, but it's like, it, you know, the thing is though, is I, <laughs> Okay, so I have so many thoughts about this. Okay. Oh yeah, you're gonna turn the burner up. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, you know, I, I'm not angry about it in any sense of the, but I do have a lot of you know different feelings. Like, you know, first off, I, I'm a fan of street art, and mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with you know a lot of um, like what they would call they call these guys writers because what they're doing is writing their name, right? As opposed to a tagger, which is like. The difference between a tagger and a writer is writer is putting like some artistic effort into what they're doing. A tagger is like you've seen these on the street, some probably where it's just like somebody wrote in a single color in right. spray paint, like their moniker, you know, like and just left. And they do that all the way down the street and they tag a car, or they tag a window, 
Yeah, so that's a tagger. Those those guys are the dregs of humanity, in my opinion. Normally, you know, if I saw somebody paint like some, one of these, you know, writing, if they were writing across like somebody's car or something like that, I'd be pissed about it. I had a neighbor who was at a um, uh, he would do he would sell vintage furniture out of his um, garage or whatever, but he would do like shows at like like uh, vintage shows or whatever at like flea market. Long Beach and yeah. yeah, flea markets and stuff like that. But so somebody would write and they would tag on a, on his on his van and then he would try to paint over it. He had this paint that roller that he would paint over with and somebody would just come right back and do it again. It was mm. so sh- sh- for him and I hated that for him. Um, but I do appreciate when it's done when it's done well in a place that isn't like it's you're not damaging trespassing. Right. Yeah. Right. Or you're you're not damaging somebody else's property, like a private citizen's property. That said, this this bit like that's happening on this building is almost I can almost guarantee it's going to come down to a, a city problem or a county problem, which is probably going to come to me in our household. Right. We're, mm-hmm. um, I hope it doesn't do that. I hope that's not the case, but I'm well, I, the I developers know, out of money. Yeah. I just know what's probably likely going to happen is they'll probably try to sell it to somebody or the state right. will uh, pick it up. They'll buy it. They'll eminent domain. Sell it to- the right. new owner would have to clean it up. Right, exactly. Um, but there'll probably be, obviously, the state will have to, you know, pay some of that, which will obviously ultimately come to some of our taxes yeah. or whatever. But yeah, the thing about this is, is and the, a lot of people didn't know this, that there, a similar thing happened in um, in Florida during Art Basel last year. And it wasn't it wasn't the same situation. It was a much smaller building. But it was a it was a similar idea where you had like sections like this. This building has like these different sections and different floors, and each section had a different artist take on it. But this was during an art week in Florida, in Miami, so it was a different vibe. This is this is a whole different thing. And well, what, they're pulling they're pulling people out of there with guns and and warrants. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's a whole different thing. But the thing is, is that it's and it's a mix. And this is Los Angeles in general. Like this is just a vibe, and you know, like we the Lakers win a championship and they burn the city down. Yeah, it's so stupid and weird. But at the other yeah. side of things, there's these guys that the original guys that started it, who started the trend, the crew that started it, they did it as a protest against this building because there's all this homelessness in Los Angeles. Homelessness is a traumatic situation in Los Angeles. It is so bad. It is so horrible out there right now and that you have this 27 story tall building luxury building luxury building that's like got like you can't do anything with it and it's just taking up space and like why are we just letting this happen for how many years and so they it was kind of like a little bit of a sense of like i wouldn't call it a protest so much as it is like like just you know trying to bring attention to an idea. And I think that has happened, right? Obviously the news is ca- is capturing it all over the world now. It's like become like an international story. And and that is that. However, there's a lot of guys that are going up there that are tagging that don't really care about that mm-hmm. story. They just want to get their name up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> They're just trying they to want get to be up they want to be in the news. They want the name on the news. Yeah. Right. That's right. a bit it's a situation all around, I think. Yeah. It's bad all the way around. I I appreciate as a, as an artist, I appreciate mm-hmm. the visual aesthetic of it. To me, it feels like when I look at that building, like if I were rich enough to own that building, I would leave mm-hmm. it. I would 100% leave it. Right. Mm-hmm. And I would, I would make it a, a, a thing. Like it would be, that would be the aesthetic of that building to me because I would invite these guys to come in and tag it if they want it, you know, but not let I him mean, tag over it, right? <laughs> it's a neat, I mean, you should, if you haven't seen this building, you should look at, you know, Google Los Angeles graffiti building because the way that the building is designed, the, the, each uh, floor, it, it's a, a perfect canvas shape and size. Very, um, what do you call it? Uh, it's even Steven balanced. Yeah. It looks yeah. kind of cool, but the fact that they're, you know, you, when you look close and the doors are broken, you know, it's a, it's not a, yeah, it's no, not they, pretty up close. <laughs> no, they, dangerous. they've trashed the place. They've trashed right, the place. Right, it's trashed. Yeah, yeah. that's from too a, bad. Fr- from a distance of what a lot of people are seeing or from like the, the helicopter right. views from, or whatever. Yeah, the drone. It fo- looks yeah. interesting, right? Right. 
you know, but it's but there's a lot of debauchery going on inside, right? One hundred percent, right? So it's yeah, it's definitely not a a real artistic pursuit. It's definitely like, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm just here to get my name up, right? You know, so at all costs, yeah, exactly, one hundred percent. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. I mean, I'm sure the the I don't know. It could end up being depending on how quickly the whole building situation gets gets rectified. Um, it could become one of these places that just be like, there's, there's spots in like New York and Miami and San Francisco that are known for being a spot to, for other, like an artist will go in and paint and then they'll paint over somebody else's work that's been there for a long time to kind of refresh the area. And it's just kind of like become like a known area that you go back into and you do and you touch up. Right. And, and so that's, that's going to happen. Um, you know, for a little bit, but we'll see how long it lasts. So, yeah. That's our third segment right there. That's our fourth segment yeah. at this point. Well, I don't know. <laughs> we had a lot of segments. We, we were in a little bit long today, but so I wanted to, I'll do this real close, a surprise segment, What I Know with Julie. I'm Julie, and this is What I Know, real super quick here because we're at the end <laughs> of the broadcast. I just want to give a, a, a word of encouragement to everybody that might have started a creative project on January 1st. There's a lot of these, you know, 100 days of this, 30 days of this, month of this, blah, blah, blah. blah takes a really long time to develop that sort of uh, a habit like that. And a lot of people, you know, what, like same things with diet and exercise, somebody, you might be falling off the bandwagon right now with that. I just want to tell you that if you're feeling overwhelmed or falling behind in any of these sort of creative challenges that, that may have been started, it's okay. Take the break, recognize that you are, that your creativity, even for somebody who's very experienced and been doing it for a long time, it ebbs and flows. So recognize what is happening, walk outside, I mean, weather permitting, and take the break. Take the break and feel free that you don't have to conform to a set standard of, I need to do a painting every 30 days or I'm a loser, because you're not. Just take the time. We all, Everybody processes that sort of energy differently and that's my what i know for today hmm. they said that was so nice that was nice yeah and you kept <laughs> it you. under a minute <laughs> oh i think i yeah i wasn't even looking you're the only the, one I, that know. gets it sticks us to a schedule it keeps to the schedule <laughs> i'm on the schedule dave yeah. do you have anything to share at the end of the broadcast uh, oh, yeah. broadca- so what is this? this is a broadcast podcast a broad yeah it's do you a have anything pod. to share a broad <laughs> do you have anything to share at the end of the broad pod Yes, we'll call this. Uh, we're calling this section the Dave Dujour, and yes, you know, it's almost tell us. like I was a little bit worried that you were gonna like, like you were almost like edging into like, like my, what my Dave Dave Dujour is. Uh oh, um, a little bit. You were getting a little close. I was like, oh god, okay, people have to teetering. Mine. <laughs> <laughs> but, te- this so, is dangerous. <laughs> so I've had this thought, you know, and I'm and I'm sharing this because I want people to understand that you know I know that I recognize people don't. Um, don't always feel the best about their work and they don't always feel like they're headed in the right direction. Um, just to Julie's point is that I have been feeling lately that like I haven't been happy with some of the work that I have been producing. Like, I feel like I am in an ugly stage of my work right now. And some people would probably disagree with me, but it hasn't felt good. And so I'm trying to rethink how I do my work. And I think that's just like one of these things, like it's okay, just like you said, to take a break and really kind of, you know, step back and spend some time to think about it. And I think part of this is also that I, that I took a long break away from art in general, yeah. but now that I'm getting back into it, it feels, it doesn't feel great for me right now. You need a little so, more oil. Yes. A little more right. time, right? A little more and, grease, right? A little more grease right. in the wheels, right? And so I, it, and, but being okay with that, right? Being okay with knowing that like, it's not great now, but if I keep messing with it a little bit and keep trying new things here and there, it will get better. You know, if you look at some of the great artists out there and you go through their different periods of their work, you'll see that there are some spots there was like, well, this wasn't their best work, right? And they probably felt the same thing. So if you're feeling that, you know, be be okay knowing that there's something good coming. You just kind of have to keep, just let it, let, let's see how it plays out. And, you know, maybe in the future I'll do better stuff. Everything's (laughs) going to be okay. Yes. We're ending the podcast episode three on a very happy note. Everything is going to be okay. You're going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. You know, one (laughs) thing we haven't done, Julie. What? Where can people find you? Oh, they can find me on julieprichard.com. That's 
Julie, J U L I E P R I C H A R D dot com. Good job. And I blog. Can find, and a blog. I, you know, I, I, everything's, I got everything going. I've got it all going there. Yeah, she's got courses. She's got art. She's got uh, yeah. Yeah, subscriptions. She's got a blog. Right? She's got, got videos. It all. A lot of socks and underwear. I'm a sellout. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Yeah. And then you can find me. You can find me a couple places, but right now the best place you can find me is over at thehungry.art, where is the creative business newsletter where I talk about news insights, you know, com- you know, commiserations or whatever it is you would like to call it about the, you know, our job as creative people trying to sell our work to others and uh, do so in a way that feels best for us and makes us happy. So go over to thehungry.art and check it out. Go to julieprichard.com, check her out. And, uh, you know, and then share this with all your friends. Make sure you subscribe. Yeah. And hit the like button. We and, appreciate you. Yeah. And I would like you to go down to the comment section and make sure you say, tell us who you are, what you do, and maybe if there's something we can talk about that would help you better and, uh, you know, doing your thing. Yes. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you again next time. Okay. Take care. <laughs>